Welcome back to another Motobot video where you join me in Spain today for a momentous motorcycle launch. This is the Harley Davidson Nightster. It's a massive deal because this is effectively the replacement for the Sportster and that's a bike that's got a huge following and I think it's fair to say it's achieved cult status. Thing is it was getting a little long in the tooth, firstly in terms of emissions but also from a performance perspective and so this bike solves a lot of those problems. But in doing so and modernizing it, have they removed some of the soul and character that made the Sportster so popular. Well, the good news is I've been riding it all morning. And so in this video, I'll go through all of the details and tell you exactly how it feels on the road. But before we get started, a massive thanks to Pando Moto for sponsoring the channel. Not only do they make the riding gear that I'm wearing today, so the Husky jacket, the Robbie jeans, the Onyx gloves, but also they've got some really clever other products in their lineup. I've been trying out the skin and shell base layers, both of which are abrasion resistant and they take armor. So if it's a hot day or you're riding around town, you can wear regular clothing over the top and the skin and shell are gonna keep you safe. Once again, a massive thanks to Pando for their support and you can find out more about all of their products through the links in the description. Now look, the biggest departure away from the air-cooled Sportsters on this bike is the engine. This is the 975cc variant of their Revolution Max V-Twin, and so it has a lot in common with the 1250 version that you'll find in the Pan America Adventure Bike and the Sportster S. It's liquid-cooled, it's got variable valve timing on the intake on this bike, and so it feels much more like a thoroughly modern V-Twin. It revs up a lot more than what you typically find in the Harley lineup. As a result, it makes 89 horsepower peak, which which is much more competitive and a big jump up from the previous gen Sportsters. And yet it still makes good torque. So 95 Newton meters, somewhere between five and 6,000 RPM. Out on the road, it really is a completely different beast. It still has plenty of guts in the mid range. It still has enough low end, but it'll just keep climbing through the rev range up to the red line, which is somewhere around nine or nine and a half thousand RPM. There's plenty enough peak power up there, certainly for road riding, and it'll be much more punchy than other Sportsters if that's what you're used to riding. It's also very smooth. It almost doesn't feel like you're riding a big American V-Twin. It's definitely got a more refined feel, so that'll be a big bonus if you're doing a lot of mileage and you want to keep the vibes to a minimum. Other people might prefer a bit of shake and grunt. It's definitely a bit less characterful and distinctive, but personally, especially on the sorts of roads we've been on today, I'd take the peak power. The only thing I didn't get on so well with is the throttle. I think it's fine when the revs are up and you're pushing the bike a little bit harder, when you're being a bit more aggressive with your throttle inputs, but in the lower gears and in low speed corners and when you're maneuvering around town, it's just a little bit choppy. It's quite a soft delivery and so I've had it in sport mode to liven it up, but then when you go from a closed throttle to just cracking it open, there's quite a pronounced lag and then it kicks in and sort of jolts. So if you're trying to be smooth or you're just getting on the gas to settle the bike mid corner, you know, you'd want it just to ease into it a little bit more. But that aside, I'm pretty impressed with the engine. It really is a lot more sporty and it rewards you more for that quicker riding. Now, another big change for this bike is the chassis and overall the bike is much, much lighter. 221 kilograms curb, so that's like 30 or 40 kilo shed. And a lot of that's gonna be this smaller, lighter engine, but also the fact that it's used as a stress member, so you don't have a steel cradle frame. So you've got a front frame bolted to the engine here, the swing arm mounts down at the back of the engine, and then a subframe mounted at the top here. But it's not just the reduction in weight, it's also very low slung. And a big part of that is the fuel tank. Similar to the Indian FTR line of bikes, it's actually mounted under the seat, but whereas that bike goes kind of along, the fuel tank is actually down here between the engine and the back wheel. To fill it up, you've got to put a key in this side and flip the seat up and then you'll find the filler cap under there. And it's 11.7 liters, which is pretty decent. I think at the claimed consumption figures, you'll get about 140 miles, which is not too bad for a Sportster. Now this quite convincing fake tank that echoes the sort of traditional Sportster look 
is actually the airbox cover. And so that means that really all the heavy stuff is down below the line of the seat. It really is a transformation. I haven't had a moment today where I've thought, oh, this feels a bit heavy or like it's a little bit difficult to manage. Certainly through corners, it feels a lot more lively. It handles much better, but also when you're doing press days like this there's a lot of photography and video on the same stretch of road so you've got to do low speed turns in gravelly laybys and this just feels super easy to manage even in those slightly tricky conditions suspensions a little better than what you'd normally find on a sportster so you've got a right way up fork preload adjustable twin shocks and both are made by showa they're not particularly super refined they're not as good as like the sportster s but they do the job just about well enough and i was impressed by the brakes so you get a four hot single Brembo at the front but I think it's the Brembo radial master cylinder that just gives it a nice feel and there's plenty of stopping power. At the front you've got a 19 inch cast aluminium wheel and then a 16 incher at the rear and tyres are co-branded with Harley and Dunlop. Perfectly adequate for the sort of riding we've been doing today although it has been dry so we haven't been able to test them out in the wet. But in summary you know with that more powerful and revvy engine and then all that weight lost it really is a much more engaging bike to ride. You know it's sort of inherited some of the good stuff from the Sportster S which is a bike that I really enjoyed riding. The only major downside with it is it's not particularly comfort orientated. It's a thin seat, not much travel in the rear shocks and so it's good to see a more comfortable setup here. My preferred setup on a cruiser is mid pegs like this and then a fairly flat bar and this just suits me down to the ground. The seat height is super low at 705 mil and there's a decent amount of cushioning so I found it very comfortable for the four or so hours we've been riding. As per usual with a Harley though you can really dial it into your own preference so I think there's a few different options for bars. You can get a pillion seat and I think I'm right in saying that you can probably move the foot pegs forward as well. Now compared to the previous gen Sportster it really isn't that different and especially with that customizability if you like the riding position of that line of bikes you should be able to find a setup with this one that you get on with. Now tech wise it really did need a bit of an update as well to compete with other similar bikes in the market. It doesn't get the full on like TFT dash and lean sensitive rider aids like you get with the Sportster S, but there's just enough there to make it competitive in 2022. So you've got three riding modes of rain, road and sport. Like I say, I've mainly been in sport today just because I much prefer that livelier throttle response. Rain is exceptionally soft on the throttle. It might be nice for newer riders, but for me, it's a little too soft. And so realistically, I probably go between road and sport. Now you get ABS on this bike, which isn't switchable. Traction control which is switchable and then also engine drag torque control. That's a little bit like traction control in reverse so when you're off the throttle it manages the engine to make sure that the rear wheel doesn't lock up. All that stuff is managed through an LCD insert in the analog speedo and it's a nice clean cockpit and I found the switch gear nice and easy to use. There's a couple of extra little conveniences as well so you get keyless ignition which I quite like not for the fuel cap or the steering lock but it does add a little bit of convenience and then also you've got self cancelling indicators. Now in terms of looks, I mean the overall silhouette is classic Sportster. Low at the back, single seat as standard, and then it sort of ramps up into that tank shape and I really like this little fairing on the front as well. The wheel sizes also give it the right stance. The Sportster S is a little bit unusual looking with that very fat front end. This is much more in line with what you'd expect, but it's the details when you're up close where it looks a lot more modern. Things like the choice of finishes, the fact that the engine is liquid cooled so you've got the radiator and back battery slunk under the front of the engine and so it sort of balances the two the old school stance with the modern finish personally i think it's a success certainly on that side of the bike it's quite good looking as is often the case it's not quite as attractive on this side but especially as the days worn on and especially in this gray finish you can get red or black but this is the one for me i really like what they've done with it but like i always say looks are subjective so let me know what you think of it down in the comments below now in terms of price it starts at just under 13 grand in the uk I think it's almost the exact same price or it may be the exact same price as the Indian Scout Bobber and so with that being its closest rival you could say it's competitively priced. If however you're comparing it to stuff like the Bonnevilles and other sort of slightly retro looking bikes 13 grand does look a little bit steep. Stuff like the Speed Twin for example great looking bike performs really well and that starts at about 11 grand. Thing 
it's, it's a different situation in the US than the UK. It's always going to be cheaper there. The starting price in the US is just over $13,000. And so if you convert the currency, that's equivalent to around about 10 grand. That makes it a much more compelling buy. Perhaps a saving grace in the UK is the fact that Harleys hold their value exceptionally well. The result is that because PCP monthlies are based on an estimated residual value, you can actually get one for about 125 quid a month. That sounds a lot more palatable to me, so it really comes down to how you like to buy your bikes. But the question remains, is this a worthy successor to the Sportster lineup? Honestly, it does look similar, but the ride is almost completely different. Much lighter, much more powerful, and the engine character is really very different. If you like that sort of old school, torquey, chuggy twin, then it might take a little bit of getting used to. But if you're someone who likes to rev your bikes a bit and you like a bit of top end rush, then I'm almost certain you're gonna get on with this much better than previous gen sportsters. As always, let me know what you think of it down in the comments below. And if you're new here and you wanna see more videos like this, hit subscribe and I'll catch you in the next one.